Welcome to the Curve Thought Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Rathlamfer. In today's episode, I'll be talking with Richard Schulberg. He is a gamer, classical musician, and all around really great guy. Um, his primary claim to fame, most of you might know him as, anybody who knows him will probably know him as Demonic. He used to work for Telcom, um, doing their ga- the gaming journalism side of things for them. Basically, any important article that was written by, by Telcom about gaming, especially on their digital gaming league site, was pretty much the entire contribution of Richard. If you met a person who Telcom hired over the years in order to do the various gaming events they've done, such as ra- the various rages, Richard was involved. He was that guy. So he's been involved, been around the block. We cover quite a few issues today. Um, we talk about life as a gay man in an extremely homophobic country talk about the pressures of coming out not necessarily in terms of your sexuality but in any way that your family might disagree with we discuss aspirations happiness and just all around how to communicate with other human beings i enjoyed this conversation fantastically and without any further ado i give you richard schulberg <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode four or five. I'm not sure exactly what order I'm going to put this in, but this is Curve Thought. I'm Sean Rathlamfu. Today, I'm not alone. I'm joined by Richard. Some of you, most Hello. of you, probably know him as Demonic. How are you doing, man? I'm doing very well today. How are you doing? I'm, I'm good, actually. And I think it's actually appropriate that I mentioned the fact that people might know you as Demonic, given that we just came from casting Dota this weekend, which That's was fair, fun. Yeah. Um, one of the things we're talking to one of our other colleagues about, right, is so we all know in this community that there is a there's issues, right? For example, let's say with racism, right? Oh, on yeah. the one hand, we as you know, as casters, as professionals, you know, we have a duty to make sure that we you know, do our jobs, we do the thing that we signed on to do, right? But at the same time, we might hold particular personal biases uh, that might not allow us to be objective in what we do. So. What do you think? Let's say, let me put it this way. If you have a situation where you have a moral quandary, right, that might conflict with you doing your job, what do you do in those circumstances? Um, I, I've actually been in this, this situation before, not in a, in a gaming sense. It was actually a, a musical aspect. Mm. And um, there was a certain person in the orchestra that for some reason just continuously was... Uh, not intentionally, but being incredibly racist towards certain members of the orchestra. Mm. Um, And at the end of the day, you've got to get down and just do your job as as much as possible, right? And not let that, because essentially, well, it depends on what you're doing, but essentially that's outside the context, it may be outside the context of what you're doing, right? Just Mm. like, you know, I I know what you're talking about in a a personal aspect, but... uh, you have to you just have to sit down not let it worry you as much as possible and do your do your job or what you, what you get paid to do first of all that's 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 how i approach the matter and then once it's done then go to maybe go to said person and say listen this is uh we've done what's done is done but this is this is not cool and i'm not not cool with it you know what i mean that makes sense do you think though that there's certain careers in which you don't necessarily have that freedom where you oh, absolutely yeah so actually like, so, let's, so let's think about this so i think i think for example in what careers would you have to have that it wouldn't be possible for you to divorce your what you actually think so let's say if you're a psychologist for example right um does psychology count no yeah i think psychology counts right let's say you're a psychologist and you find somebody in engaging in extremely abusive behavior right but then yeah but then they also need your help what do you do? Let's say you're the psychologist. Um, neither of us are, given that maybe the, this is why we haven't taken that oath to help people. But what do you think should be done, actually? Do you think like psychologists should be allowed to help people that they find to be genuinely morally reprehensible? I mean, they can certainly try. I think is the best is the best uh, the best the best thing I could say. You know what I mean? Like there may be people there may be people that are just too stuck in their ways but i find that humans are are malleable for the most part um so 
we we do have the ability to to change and and adapt and like most of the time it's pe- people are just stuck or s- stuck in a thir- certain mindset or mm. pattern of behavior that needs to be broken or shifted somehow you know and once they realize what they're doing is wrong most of the time people go back and and apologize and and you know the the, the path to healing can begin in that cheese that cheesy sort of way mm. so even though they may be morally reprehensible i feel like there's always there's always hope to actually to turn things around that makes sense um actually you know this is one of those things that i keep thinking about right rook so the difficulty of acknowledging how you've changed as a person right because i think w- w- most of us have this image in our mind this perception that we've effectively remained static right that you're the same person as you were five ten years ago whatever and you don't necessarily it's hard from unless you're really paying attention it's kind of difficult to track exactly the ways you've changed yeah. Um, but don't you find it interesting that like there's certain changes that once they become once they come out right once they become relevant that it actually kind of changes almost everything about you as a person. Um, for me, I think one of the easiest examples is you know the go-to example is always religion, right? The type of person that you are when you're religious is not it's completely opposite from the type of person that you might become once you leave that religion. But it's very difficult to actually sit down and say specifically what it is that changed about you. Um, without yeah. delving deeply into it, um, what, what do you think? What, what's the thing that you've changed the most about in in your time on this planet? Well, I mean, I think probably well, people's perception of me is that most people didn't think I was a gay man for a very long time, and then that, I sort of shattered that vibe uh, in in a single blog post because I was just just threw it out into the world, and I was like, there it is. Mm. And then I think people's perceptions of me changed quite rapidly because i don't know i'm quite a quiet person at the best of times Mm. so i think people used to think that me being quiet was i don't know it's just kind of people i used to people used to call me intimidating which i never thought of myself as being an intimidating an intimidating person um but then i think that that perception has changed changed a lot and then i was just like actually just a shy little quiet gay guy more than anything else (laughs) i feel like you get treated differently now after having come out uh, yeah definitely like in what in what ways do you think um i th- i find i found that that uh actually women's treatment of me has changed radically because i've mm-hmm. like you you go f- i think you go from being like i think women are very wary at uh, at the best of times so you go from being like a sexual predator to or potential sexual predator to just a guy you know what i mean that they can actually talk to and interact with comfortably i don't know if that makes sense but it's that sort of sort of felt that way right you sort of like no the interaction's been far more like open than what i'd say if when i was sort of like a straight guy no, that does make sense because like we can't ignore the fact that women do have to watch out for themselves right absolutely so, yeah i think it's kind of that thing like you often find say for example um using your example of that previous guy like that that dude in the orchestra right the the somewhat racist yeah, yeah. person right as soon as that guy came like let's say you knew you didn't know he was a racist in any way or you let's say you thought he was racist given the things that he might have said or the way he might have behaved once that behavior changes right it really does change not only how you think about him but you the behaviors you allow yourself to exhibit around that person kind of change as well oh absolutely uh, so yeah i think that might be the case with women as well um speaking of women actually this is something that i've been thinking about the, the, you brought this up to my attention a while ago about oh the fact that there's <laughs> um, about vanity as it were within the gay community yeah. right? um and vanity obviously plays a huge and detrimental role to all relationships as they evolve between people in general but mm-hmm. one thing i was thinking about is perhaps it could be the case that it gets exacerbated worse in the gay community because men have been as men, right, we're, t- we're taught to value appearance. Right? Now, usually it characterizes itself as, you know, you value a female's appearance above and beyond all things, right? But I'm not entirely sure that simply changing the, like, as soon as you have an attraction to a non-female, that that language necessarily changes. Uh, that's, I think that's still something that we're very much used to, right? And I think it gets yeah. worse. And I think it's worse when it's other men involved because there's still not an expectation that men should be open with their feelings and men should be hurt by it right men are taught that like, oh if you're not valued for your appearance whatever just move on it's not that big a deal bro so yeah 
but 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 like we spoke about this at length but just for just for the people on the other side can you just walk me through what you're thinking when you speak about this level of vanity in the gay community well i was i'm i was just uh, at the time i think i was referring to like the various the various gay apps and things and mm. ways like generally that gay people go about meeting each other is mostly through these very you know be it grinder there's horn if there's gosh there's all sorts of different tinder you know there's all sorts of things that you can use mm. um uh, but and oh, and all of it's very vanity based, right? The first thing you see is like a picture of the person without knowing anything about them. That is whether someone t speaks like speaks back to you or not is entirely whether or find whether or not they find you like even remotely attractive, mm. which is um, which is vain in at, at at like the best of times, right? But it's also cop like it's also compounded by the fact that like gaydom in itself is is compartmentalized in that there are different types of gays. You can be like a bear or a twink or a, a nerd or gamer, whatever, you know, they're like, so you, and then you have to fall within like that category, right? Like I would be a gamer yeah. um, or a bear because I'm a fairly hairy human being. Those would be my, like, those would be my categories and people tend to, I don't know. It's, it's very, so like, you before you even get started you have you have these labels just thrown on you by people that people that you haven't even spoke to in your entire life mm. which makes things which makes things like very difficult right because if, if relationships are, are stab established on that sort of vanity to begin with what hope do you have of having any sort of meaningful like relationship with that with that person if there's always that sort of like vain undertone have you um, underneath have you found it to be the case that um, people people would like specifically say like do how how often does it come up where people say they're only looking for example for bears or twinks or for gamer is that like is it oh, very very often so is it it's like a fairly that's so, a fairly common thing so it's not simply about self identification it's about people seek sp people who specifically identify in that way absolutely yeah that's um like they like they would um. Uh, a lot of like the more muscular guys will be like only muscular people as well. You know what I mean? Mm. Or uh, a lot of the a lot of the bears would be like, um, a lot of the hairy guys would only want other hairy guys as well. You it's know, just a random thing. I was thinking uh, now, now, now that you bring this up, right? The other day I was talking to somebody about Tinder, right? Because so they use Tinder and they were saying that they want to delete it because it's effectively just become a machine for hookups. Um, but I was thinking that obviously, like, it seems clear that that would be the result effect of a dating app like Tinder, you know, or, or just any anything that increases convenience in that way, where you can just sit down, look, cycle through pictures, find someone attractive, and then talk to them. Um, yeah, seems likely to lead to hookup culture, right? But what, what did, I was thinking about now that as you're speaking about the gay hookup apps, I'm thinking it could be the case that the way that we talk about these apps or the way that we interact with each other online in online spaces right usually between men and women or at least we normally put women into the category that we expect them to always be after a long deep commitment after a conversation you yeah know, where the looks are the secondary thing right but it's a little bit more acceptable for a guy to just be upfront and out there and say i just want sex or i just want to hook up with you um do you think so with Tinder starting, Tinder started ostensibly as a pure dating app for these kind of conversations and then turned into a hookup thing. Do you think the opposite is ever true? Like, do you think it ever happens that something starts off being purely for getting hookups, but then you actually end up finding meaningful relationships through it? Uh, well, considering that's sort of how my current relationship started. Uh... Hey. <laughs> hey. 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 Um, sort of, actually, no, he just wanted me to go for a drink, but yes i would i would actually say that like on the gay side of things tinder i would that would be like the most um gentle of the apps yeah uh in that you would actually mostly find people there that are in, in a gay sense actually looking for relationships and that kind of thing whereas mm -hmm. the other apps are more steered towards the hookup kind of thing so in the gay community it's actually kind of plan it's gone a little bit differently and that tinder is not our hookup app i would say mm. um in in the slightest we have we we have other means right we have grinder where it shows people literally like around you you know i had one uh, i i have a friend of mine uh who who lives in the the apartment complex next to me and it's you know it once showed me that he was 
what, three or four meters away from me. And I, yeah. I messaged him out of the blue and I said, how can you be three or four meters away from me? That's insane. And it turned out that he actually just lived next door to me. But it was, you know, like these things, those you can see the people literally around you. If you want to get a hookup, it can happen within 20 minutes. You know what I mean? Whereas Tinder, the range is a bit bigger. You know, it doesn't share your actual location. Yeah, so yeah. in terms of in terms of hookups, that's definitely a bit a bit slower or a bit. I think like because like Tinder, because it's harder to use in that sense, it kind of requires work. Also, you have to get the other person to like you as well. It's not like you can't just batch message everybody and see what comes up immediately and then decide from there. Um, uh, exactly. Grinder does seem hella convenient. Like whenever I see it, um, or I see people around me using it, it's just like, damn, okay, this seems like one of the fastest ways that you could ever use to get something out of this. Um, that being said though, what do you think? Um, do you think it actually is healthy long term? Like how long do you think you can use Grinder for before it starts to become a problem right in the same way that like most people would never frown upon casual dating but there's a point there's a point where it becomes an issue so do you think extended use of grinder specifically grinder given the ease of execution that's available to you when you're using the app do you think it ever becomes an issue i i think it depends on your relationship and your view with with the app itself like for example i um everyone renaming you know being anonymous here but i have a friend of mine who is him and his boyfriend are very much into all sorts of strange habits mm. and for them grinder is a very useful is a very useful tool right um so like in that aspect they they are fully prepared they pay for like the premium you know i've actually chatted to them chatted to him about it and uh you know for him it's an extremely useful tool like for me i find it a hilarious place more than anything else as just sort of a dude um yeah. uh and gosh i haven't been on it in in ages but i i generally get bored with it after a while and then just delete it um because there are some people that like do want to talk and i've met some interesting people on there mm. like as a result but i've also met some people that i wish i'd rather not if that may if that makes sense <laughs> as well so yeah. Let, 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 let's step back from one second from like the actual usage of it right because one thing that's always interested me very much about just a grinder in the South African context, in that in SA, for instance, like when you came out with your blog post, um, one thing that it surprised me, but also didn't surprise me, right, was the the level of surprise. Everyone was like, "Oh my gosh, we never knew this is amazing." You know, we're here for you, we're happy for you, we're gonna allow you to live your life, whatever, right? But we can't escape the fact that overall, South Africa is still a very homophobic country. Abs um, absolutely. <laughs> It's bad, like it's 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 bad to the point where today, well, was it today or last night? I was on there's this group on Facebook I was on, and somebody posted a video there of this gay couple get like these these, these people getting married, not getting married, it was an engagement I think, uh, where they were in a jewelry shop. The one dude bought a ring, got on his knees, they proposed, everyone kissed, you know, usual yeah. thing happening. And let me actually, I actually think I have it open here. So of the comments that exist, right, it's just shy of sixty comments, I would say. 80 85% of them were people hating and people being fairly upset about this entire thing um, But then the interesting thing is that so let's say you would take that statistic, right? Even if you go a low ball estimate you post anything gay on Facebook you'd find 60% people would disagree Yeah, how does that explain just how many people are on grinder because every time I've seen grinder, right? It's like wow, okay. There's a lot of people here. Like I've never seen some I've never heard of somebody using grinder and then in a, let's say, 10, like 10K radius, there's not a single person around, right? There's always somebody. It depends where you are, actually. Like, to have a story from this, I was, I was playing in the orchestra in Bloemfontein. Mm -hmm. So um, when I use, for example, when I use Grindy here, I can see people maybe up until, I live in Rondebosch, I can see people maybe up until town, which is about seven kilometers away from me. Yeah. Um, and that's about as far as you can, you can see. Whereas when I logged in to Grindr in, in Bloemfontein, which is very much a conservative Afrikaans town, I could see people up to 300 kilometers away from me. Three, but uh, that's Bloemfontein though. Bloemfontein, like, that's the middle of nowhere. And it's, yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's not like they're not gay people in that town. I feel like most of them just haven't, I are either like very much still playing in Narnia mm -hmm. so far in their causes because they're scared that their family's going to disown them and obviously religious reasons and cultural reasons that are 
prevalent uh, in that in that part of the world. And there's also like just I I, f I feel like people don't have the the confidence to even go onto that app. Like most of the people that were on there were actually people that were married, like oh. to women, and were looking for stuckies on the side. You know what I mean? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. It's really interesting. Like, what do you? How does that conversation go though? Like, because I've always wondered in in, in my mind. Because usually when you find these type of men who will be married, have a wife, have a family, right? It's the infidelity aside, which is one, which is a huge issue, you know. But that aside, you'll find that these are the guys who will be most stridently homophobic, like in public, who talk the most amount of trash about how unnatural it is or how um, they care about genuine family values or things yeah. like that. So. Like, do you think that it's the case that homophobia in general is usually indicative of, like, being in the closet? Or is it just some people using being an asshole as cover to be like, you'll never suspect that I'm doing now on the background? Uh, I think it's a bit of both. Um, you know, situation, situation dependent. I think that it, it can a lot of time be just a cover for the fact that they're hiding their own sort of homosexual feelings and that they have these other cultural and social influences that are in their head sort of putting them to you know at war with themselves against that which i to me is disgusting right i, yeah. I find that like t just appalling that these people even have to like have that struggle inside their head but and then like and other times it can just be you're a bit of a dick you know, yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> just being a jackass <laughs> you're like what's wrong with you mate do you think that yeah. do you think um the way that society we think about homosexuality do you think it would change if we taught in schools the fact that homosexuality is rampant throughout every like form of life that we know of that it's um, just... i think i i don't even think it needs to be that i think it needs to be um it needs to be taught from the tribal evolutionary standpoint in that the gay gene existed for a reason and science has since proven why it why um there's a fascinating ted talk um I forget the man's the man's name, but he talks about uh, he has a gay son, and he talks about sort of the evolutionary aspect why this gay gene exists, and basically you know like because it's obviously existed as long as as long as humans have existed, mm. and it's essentially we are the um, the people that bind the family together, uh, if if that makes sense, and so like they are the people that when they have problems or something that you know the, the gay person would be the person that they'd go to speak to which is fairly true as well you know like there are a lot of um i would say gay guys you know lesbians they're all very friendly people for the most for the most part um and willing to listen and and interact obviously there are exceptions but i think for the most part from my experiences they've been uh in terms of under, as an understanding community, a, a, a very understanding one in some in some respects. Why do you think that's the case, though? Like, um, or rather, what is the? Because as he, if he describes it in an evolutionary psychology sense, right, in, the, in terms of that they bind the family together. So, what would it be about simply being gay that would, from from an evolutionary perspective, right? Like, what is it that what what does it give you that gives you the ability to? be that family unifier is it the they had much higher scores on empathy they had much higher um like uh conversational and listening listening skills uh in general so just to show the ability to be able to like listen take in other people's problems show empathy with with other people you know to help and keep the tribe together and banded and banded together so that's that's i think if, I mean, I may be mistaken. It was. It's been a while since I since I watched that thing, but I believe those were the general sort of advantages that that we bring. Was it across like, the board, like men and women? Yeah, across the board. That's really interesting because, like, I think as you're describing it, right, that would normally most people would say, all right, that falls under the the usual trope of the sensitive gay guy. Um, yeah. But usually, the trope when you people think about lesbian women, they think about bush, rough and tumble, literally, basically men with vaginas instead of men with penises. So. Um, I would... That's true, but a lot of, I mean, if you've ever actually spoken to, to any of them, they are, some of them are extremely soft and gentle yeah. souls, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, you know what's really amazing? It's almost like gay people are human beings. I know, what? right? What? That's just, they just want to get left alone. It's boggling. <laughs> Mind boggling. Um, speaking of actually being gay, um, or something, a related topic to that, 
coming out of the closet is one of the you know there's a reason people even call it nania like there's a way yeah. to describe it we talk about it. it's a very harrowing thing but i'm not necessarily sure it's simply just like i think it's most w- widely expressed and it's most difficult to, co- to grapple with when it comes to sexuality but there's o- obviously other cases where you might just have such a wide disagreement with your family that it could result in you be you having to come out anyway for instance yeah. like when i when i when i came out to my with literally it felt like coming out in my in my opinion it felt like coming out when i told people that i was no longer religious yeah and it's like so let me, let me ask you how long did it take you before you were uh, you felt comfortable in coming like before you felt comfortable in yourself to the degree where you said even if my family is not happy about this this is still something i'm going to do for your for myself um uh, so mine was actually like a bit of a, a bit of a process i would say i first decided that i was like deeply unhappy when geez that was about six years ago right and i actually wanted to like start dating people and realized that i shouldn't be dating a woman i should be dating a man so i started sort of putting feeders out into that world and then i told some of basically my closest friends i didn't tell any of my family i told my friends um when i when i got my first boyfriend that this was this was the case and they were all very accepting that was basically like the testing the testing field Mm. And then sort of not much, uh, some shit went down and then I didn't really date for a while. Um, and then now this year I've sort of gotten back onto the bandwagon and then, um, I mean, most of my friends knew, right. My family didn't, um, just because I like, I sort of knew that they would be okay with it. So it wasn't, it wasn't really high up on my, on my priorities. Uh, but once. Uh, now and now that my mom's got grandkids and stuff, you know the pressure is the pressure is off to have, <laughs> to have children. <laughs> so it was much it was much easier to it was much easier to do so, and just say like, listen, this is actually who I am. Love it, love it to leave it. Yeah. And they were all, they were all actually very accepting, like because I have nice friends. So people that people that that uh, would have been opposed to that no longer exist in my life anyway. Don't you find that is one of the saddest things? Um, that happens is when there's an aspect of yourself that you feel you haven't necessarily grappled with fully that you come out with it and there's people who who you actually legit care about in your life that are so unaccepting that it literally creates that a a pure ultimatum situation where you realize you actually that your friendship like when you witness your friendship end in moments it's really sad like i it happens right and it's it's a sad moment but ultimately it's probably for the better Mm. right like if you reach if you reach an impasse and there's no way there's no way for you to to walk around it if it's because of his fundamental views or whatever then that just has to be it right you're different Mm. people there are seven billion humans in the world we're not all going to get along so go find people that are better suited to you you know and just learn take what you've had from the experience say it was a good friendship now it's ended move on with your life done so actually on that on that point of friendship right something i've been thinking about is that one of my bay has a friend who she would do she do a very close friends for a while and a similar situation as we're describing here happened they came to a moral impasse and they could not progress further than that and she entered the friendship but what do you think what, what happens let's say the other person comes to comes around right changes their point of view or even you change your point of view, right? Do you think it's possible, like after that initial splits happened, after it's become very clear where the battle lines are drawn, do you think that's it? Or do you think it's actually ever possible for some kind of reconciliation to happen down the line? Because I'm not sure. Like, I'm, I've been thinking about this because there are people that are, ex- have existed in my well, life. Well, it's which... like, it goes back to our previous point, right? Well, the previous uh, while back where we said that, you know, you, 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 you and you yourself, like five years from now are two completely different people, right? Yes, yeah. And that what something may have happened to him or may have been he may have experienced some sort of like discrimination or something that he says oh shit you know what i did to this person is incredibly wrong and mm-hmm. he'll come back to you and apologize and then i would always i'm always i'm always open to that kind of conversation right so i would i'm never one to just say uh oh, fuck off mate i don't i don't care for what you have to say if someone <laughs> says listen um i really feel like i, I need to speak to you because what i've done is wrong or you know, we just need to talk it out. I'll be like, sure, let's let's do it. I'm always willing willing to talk. You know what I mean? Uh, let's on. Let's talk about that willing to talk thing, right? Because 
we've all been noticing of late people talking about censorship, the dereliction of free speech in the modern age. Do you think everyone actually has a right to talk um, or have um, a platform? Or do you think sometimes that's actually, some opinions are legit and not valid? Uh, I mean, like, abs- absolutely. Some some opinions, just because you have an opinion, mm. doesn't mean it's right, right? So I think this, Brian Cox tries to nail this, tries to nail this very regularly. It's like, just because you have, you by all means have the right to your own opinion. Um, but the, there's, I think, w- like, s- social media is not what it, what it used to be, right? So it's now more like a marketing platform than it is a... a a way to connect with people. It's a way to step on your soapbox and, and, and shout your ideas, which is increasingly more and more what it's what it's become. And in that instance, I feel like it's no, just shut up. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm, I've got people from all sorts of races, creeds, religions, you know, like just to be insensitive to a whole bunch of people, um, just because you, you have a different opinion to them. Um, I don't know. Just moral. You have to think about it, about it morally as a human. Like, are you intending to actually up, upset people? Then, if you want to be that that internet troll, then by all means, go for it. But know that you're not doing yourself or anyone like any favors. I mean, some people do consider it as a favor. But some people really get off on the fact that on the ability to piss off as many people in a single setting as as possible. Right? Like, there are people who exist right now whose prime. In their, in their mind, their prime consideration of any and all engagement is to see how far you can push the other person off the deep end, to get somebody triggered, to get somebody pawned or owned, you know, and then to be able to come back and claim victory and say, yeah, you know, we pissed this person off, they lost it, now suddenly, like the idea being that once you lose it in a conversation, suddenly you can't be taken seriously, which makes no sense, right? Because I feel yeah. like there is place um, for emotion, in conversation i think there's a place for a lot of emotion as long as the things you're saying still make sense it doesn't necessarily matter if you say something idiotic and completely wrong if you say it stoically like yeah there, there, there should be some some factual basis to what you're trying to communicate but another point on this whole communicating with people thing i was talking to someone yesterday and i was saying because they were actually speaking about um gay marriage and they were saying no they they don't they don't understand it you know they don't really get the point but you know they'll they'll accept it fine whatever they'll allow people to do this thing right and i thought about that particular sentence which is something that comes up very often right people talk about i don't understand it i don't i don't i don't believe in it i don't like it but i'll accept it you're allowed to do this yeah i'm whenever people say that right do you actually think it's possible for me for example for me to treat another person with the full breadth of love compassion and empathy that i want to extend to them if i legit consider their mode of being to be wrong do you think it's actually possible to be fully humane if i say to you listen i'm going to treat you humanely but i think the way you're being human is the worst possible way right i don't i don't necessarily think that if i think that if i think you're being an awful human being i don't think i can treat you like you're a great human being i, I don't think i can treat you like extend to you the same level of breadth of compassion that i'd want to even though I, I, in principle i'd say that yes you should but i think that yeah. in the actual nitty-gritty of it if you're actually confronted with someone who embodies everything you hate about humanity. You, like, do you think it's possible to treat them fully humanely, fully happily, love and accept them completely? I mean, probably not, I would, I would say. There's, there's always going to be that thing in the back of your mind, right? Mm. And that what they're doing is, is in sin or, or what, whatever it may be. So like, I feel like anything that you try and do is just like, a front to your actual feelings if that makes sense mm. where so it will never be a genuine relationship you know what i mean it'll be polite it might be polite it might be it might be friendly but when it comes down to the crux of things will that be will that be a person that you go and have like deep in-depth conversations with mm. probably not you know it'll, but at the most it'll reach a level of like acquaintance yeah and there's yeah. And there's something to you about, about depth and conversation, right? Like, have you noticed how much you learn about yourself when you're having those conversations with people? Even if you don't necessarily reveal particular details, right? But it's, it's, it's kind of eerie how you can be going through certain things in your life and somebody around you who might not even necessarily be privy to the details of what's happening in your inner life 
will say something that resonates super deeply. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, okay, now this can provide answers to a question that I didn't even know I had or a question I had, I had but didn't know how to formulate. And this person comes in. Um, I think one of the best examples is, you know, you know when people talk about epiphanies? And yeah. How, I can't remember the last time I had anything resembling an epiphany on my own, right? Or even on purpose. It always happens in the context of another separate, completely divorced conversation. And then you're like, oh, shit, this actually makes sense. This explains yeah, everything yeah. now. Suddenly, I'm in this place. Um, well, it's because it's humans have different views and experiences, right? And and ultimately, like every human that you've ever seen and will ever see has had a whole host of experiences that you will never even dream of, dream or even think about, right? So they can come at in an open and honest conversation. They can come from their own background experiences and challenge challenge your ideas. You know what I mean? From their own experience, and, you, and that might say to you. Oh, okay. Then you have to take a step back, and you go, okay. F- you know, uh, from his ex- from his experiences, this is what he's felt. Um, you know, what what situation would you know? I generally I try to find out the situation that the people were in to like when they sort of experienced that, for example, so that you from an from an empathy sort of level, you can understand where they're coming from. You know what I mean? Why do you think it's and so that, difficult like, normally um, to cut your chain of thought? I'm sorry, just in half. But no, it's no, no problem. What you're describing is. It's the thing we all should be doing, right? But what do you think it is about whenever you encounter someone with a radically different life, right? Why is it so hard to actually do that? Like, to initiate that that empathy? Like, even if you do it, there is always this reactionary instinct in yourself to just say, yeah. no, this is how it's supposed to be, or that's not how I see life. Um, but it's because it's because we live inside live inside our bubbles, right? And we don't like to have we don't like to have that bubble burst. And I feel like. Um, I mean that's extremely appropriate to white people. I feel in general at the mm. moment is that we've had our we've had our bubble of privilege burst in a in a huge way over the past couple of years. Like we've had, people have opened the opened their eyes to the fact that yes, we're like we're doing okay now, but it's also the institutionalized like racism and colonialism that we've done for thousands of years that's helped us reach you know our levels of of successfulness no matter no matter where we are. So it's like I th- think. Um, it's not that it's not that that you even hurt it's just that someone comes in and and wants to change we're like very appropriate our brains don't like changing right Mm. they you build a set of neural pathways and they're used to that set of neural pathways and they like that set of neural pathways and then someone says to you actually that set of neural pathways is wrong you should be going in that direction and then your brain's like oh we don't you know that's not too good actually uh so you know, it's it's like it's it's actually a brain thing that we set. You know, the more we think things, the more that those things sort of become set. And then once once it's like someone comes and challenges the idea, then you have to start building a whole new set of ideas and thoughts and patterns. And your brain, at the very basic level, is like opposed to that change, right? And no, <laughs> so even from a like a basic biological level, it's it's going to be a challenging one. It's one that you just have to like actually you have to be aware that that it's happening and hold your tongue and actually listen to the person so let's let's talk about those bubbles because as you mentioned all of us do exist to some degree or another in a particular bubble that we put ourselves in um so one of the things that i'm thinking about now is what do you think is the biggest popped bubble that you've been in so for instance with me within my particular bubble in life i can say that the biggest bubble that I've had popped would be the idea that I, as a man, live in a world that is optim that is not optimized for me, right? That, you know, that it's actually all good that women have as many opportunities as I, like, I remember, when was it? 2011? There was once a massive debate myself, me, a couple of my friends and other girls were in and we were talking, I was talking about the fact that it appears to me that if you are a disabled woman, you've effectively won the lottery because now the entire universe is going to be, or the entire world is going to be bending over backwards to ensure that your life goes as smoothly as possible. And I don't think that's fair. That doesn't seem egalitarian. Um, but the realization over time that this is obviously not the case and that bubble burst for me. And in some many ways, I'm still grappling with that particular one. Um, yeah. But the, the question is, in like, as much as I grapple with this, I notice it's far more prevalent in 
a lot of the people around me in my in my own sphere of influence who haven't necessarily yet grappled with the, that question in the same way, right? So this yeah. is still something that I'm still challenging the men around me to understand. What do you think for you is the the biggest the biggest realization you've had about your own circumstances in life that you're still mostly unable to convince people around you of yet? Oh, that's um that's a tough question i would say they've been they've been they've been a few things right um they were there was the realization that uh i could just i could do it i could do things myself uh which 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 was a big one right like people didn't support me studying music and then i just said actually fuck them i it's what i love to do and i will do it anyway um like self-belief i i feel like that's that's really important the um, obviously, like the privilege thing has been has been a big thing, right? Um, and I I would say I lived a good majority of my life without even thinking about that until like it started to pop up, and then I really started to like question and look back at my life critically, if that makes if like if that makes sense to go see like look and actually said, okay, geez, I had like every opportunity that I could ever have, you know, I had every I had everything given to me on a silver platter due to the hard work of, you know, the people around me and my hardworking mother, bless her soul. Mm. And it was just, whereas, and I would look to myself and I said, cool, like, what if I was a black guy living in Motherwell Township? What opportunities would I, would I have had? And it would have been almost none in comparison. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, that to me was a huge, like a huge bubble shatterer. And it was actually a friend of mine, uh, it was actually a friend of mine that, um, that had a conversation with me, uh, we were just talking about and it was a conversation that came up to why the university entrance marks are different you know what i mean because it's like you know for black people you only have to get a d in english but for white people you have to get a b yeah or for example for some things so and he's he's like well just think about it this way like you go home to your beaut your quiet house with secure like secure gates you sit in a very quiet room and you do your homework and there's nothing to stop you from getting the best marks that you possibly can, right? Yeah. Whereas these guys will be taking, like, Normsa from the township will be taking a bus with her two kids that, like, with her two brothers and sisters that she has to look after. When she comes home, she's got a house full of people that, and perhaps the parents are both working, so then she'll have to look after, like, her brother and sister. How do you expect her to get the same grades? And I was like, you know what? That's entirely true. Yeah. Cause I used to look, I used to look at those grades and be like, Oh, why do, why do black people, you know, have to get lower marks than we do? And then that is something that like totally shattered for me. Absolutely. I'm, um, I'm fully understanding of where like that situation are. Whereas previously I was completely ignorant to it. Isn't it the strangest thing in the world to think about the way you used to think? Like when you look, when you look back and sometimes oh, you yeah. ask yourself, you're like, how on earth did I, how was I there? It's, it's not even, it's not even that like I, I was thinking wrong it was just that it, it it wasn't in your consciousness to begin with yeah. you know what i mean like the thought wasn't even there so it never you never bothered to think about it so until until someone until someone says like this is the case and you go oh shit yeah right okay. to think yeah about it. yeah you know I, I, you said something very interesting about um your own studies in music and doing music as you decided to that the understanding that you could do something for yourself you can just do it yourself you don't necessarily have to kowtow to the demands or expectations of others yeah so i've noticed with increasing regularity the fact that most people that i know who finish to you know you go you go you study get your degree you go work in the field that you studied in or get the first job that comes out of the gate most people that i know who are like who graduated and then started working within that field are unhappy right there's very few people i know who are like genuinely saying yes the part that i set out when I was 18 years old, it's still the path I want to follow for the rest of my life. And yeah. this is still where I want to be. Um, but then when you press people, you're like, okay, fine, you're unhappy, but are you willing to take the plunge and do something different, right? The answer is usually no. Like, and often, of course, the material reality is that that choice is not often available to you. But yeah. even when it is, most people are unwilling to actually take that option. Um, and I'm actually, I'm, I've been... I'm not entirely sure why I, I know why this is. What do you think? What do you think the case is about why people are still so locked into this idea of this, this is how the ladder of life progresses and there's no other path 
to getting to where you want to be? It's well, it's like it's like a combination of like the nineteen sort of fifties ideal, right? That yeah. you go, you you get your accounting degree and you go work a happy life as an accountant, and it's about that that security, uh, if you know what I mean. Sorry, I'm just going to close. There's a flippin' storm happening outside here. Oh. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so there's. You know, it's about it's about, and at the end of the day, I think it's about that that security. You know, you, you like going back and studying what you actually want to study means that you'll most likely not be able to work. You'll have to, yeah, you'll have to take a serious pay cut. You know what I mean? So like the security of your life sort of falls away to be able to do that change in the first place. Where, so like, uh, it's diff it's difficult to be able to just plunge in and do it right because they're people like to live in that again that safe secure bubble you know what i mean even if they are unhappy they're at least they, you know they've got a paycheck they live in a house you know etc etc they've got they've got what they need to live comfortably in their mind so to take that plunge is like taking a plunge essentially into the unknown because you know what are they going to get after they finish that that degree that they actually want to do in philosophy or whatever you know yeah. what is their what are their career options and i think for music you have limited career options to begin with, right? The music, the music industry is a is a struggling one uh, at the best at the best of times, um, especially the classical music where I studied. So we never really had that job security in in the in the first place. Like yeah. out of out of my class of, uh, I finished with about ten other people. I think there's one person that's actually playing in an orchestra. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are, and there's still two of us that do that still play music. Like I still play music and then my uh, friend Sally plays music as well. But like uh, other, other than that, um, I think almost all of them have gone and done something else, a secondary degree of some sort. So uh, the one's done chemistry, the one uh, I think now works at, as NAS at NASA as a, as a rocket scientist, I believe. Oh, okay. um, yeah. So they're, there's, they're all branched out into, into different things, but and if but if you ask them if they regret doing their music degree, not one of them says that they do, which yeah. is which is interesting, right? Because they still they still felt like they followed their passion, um, and they still have that passion. It's just that they have other passions as well that they're now following. Yeah, I, which I is an interesting mindset. I think it's one of those things where, um, as you mentioned, like it's firstly it's not that they don't have it's that they only have individual passions right people tend to be multifaceted in that way everyone has various yeah. interests lots of things you enjoy lots of things you want to do with your life but there's this or there's this idea of success right because if you ask somebody what does what is success to you right it's very rare that you'll encounter an individual whose idea of success has nothing to do with somebody else's idea of success there's usually a way, a paradigm where it's like, okay, this constitutes successful behavior or a successful life and something else doesn't. And it's very hard to define that for yourself, but it's a lot easier when you say, all right, let's, let's take your friend, for example, who's working at NASA. If yeah. between the friend who's working at NASA and the friend who is actually in an orchestra, if you were to ask the vast majority of the planet who is more successful, they would obviously say, well, the person who's a rocket scientist making that money and enjoying yeah. doing things that way. But if you were to ask the person who's actually playing in the orchestra, like, do you consider that success? They'd say, yes, they can't, like, what else, what else is it to them? Right? Yeah. So how do you, how do you, how do, what, what do you think we do as people to bridge the gap between personal aspirations of success versus societal expectations of success? I think you've just got to realize that societal expectations of success are false. Mm. Right. Or that the, the narrative that gets shoved on you is not one that actually makes you happy like having money you know what i mean like the 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 social narrative is to be is to be rich and famous to like i don't know get on tv or to you know there's there's no one that makes like teachers or scientists or yeah. profess like professors no there's no there are some people that are now making those things like making those places look cool but like they've never been they've never been treated as like success mm. you know what i mean that's just it's just a, a a job so we need to change we need to change our narrative as as a society to say like if you're doing what makes you happy then you are successful Some, something so, very interesting about success actually now that you're mentioning the fact that people are normally inculcated to believe that fame and money constitute success yeah. um there was a study was it washington i don't know but anyway i forgot what washington supposed to end my times but they found that 
for most Americans, young Americans now, people aren't necessarily concerned with money as much as fame nowadays, which is interesting, right? Yeah. People would want to be the be next known. Instagram star, yeah. Mm. I think it also features factors into what you were saying earlier about the fact that social media as an integral part of our lives now, which we can't really dispute anymore, is mostly now about marketing, marketing either yourself, your brand, your products, etc., rather yeah. than connecting with people, right? So it seems reasonable that if everybody takes that on hold and takes that philosophy to its natural extension, that you would want to have be famous above and beyond everything else, which is weird, right? Do you want to be famous? I don't know. If, I'm not actually sure if I want to be famous. Uh, no, I've... Um... Like I just want to, I just want to get down and do it. You know what I mean? Get down and do do what I enjoy doing. If people enjoy, enjoy what I enjoy watching me do what I enjoy doing, then then so be it. You know what I mean? I'm definitely not in it for any sort of, for any sort of like fame or power or, or like I don't know anything. I don't feel like. I mean, I feel like I'm an I'm an average entertainer at best anyway. So it's. It's, you know, if people enjoy that, then so be it. But I'm definitely not in it for, like, fame. Like, or I do, I do social media for, like, a laugh more yeah. than, more often than, more often than not. <laughs> for kicks and giggles. For kicks and giggles, exactly. That's actually an interesting place to pivot in this conversation because one of the things that is difficult to do as a person is deciding on or figuring out what you're actually good at versus what you, what you enjoy. Um, and what's... What's annoying is how little control we as people seem to have over both of these things. Um, yeah. <laughs> so very often, like it, it just so happens by happy accident that most people find pleasure in being good at stuff. So you end up enjoying what you're good at, but it's not always the case, right? And, yeah. And sometimes you find yourself in a situation where not only is it not the case, but the two are like diametrically opposed where you have to choose between one or the other. You can't necessarily do both of them. So... One of the things that I think we, we, we can talk about is how do you as a person, like even in the decision of what to do with your life, right? Where do you even start in terms of deciding something that vast, something that big, given that you're trying to make an active decision about your life, but the component variables that are involved in that decision are completely not up to you. So in that, in that situation, what do you do? Do you think you start with first trying to figure out what those variables are, or do you think you decide on the output and say, I'm going to work towards that regardless about regardless of my personal deep held inclinations toward that thing or not hmm i from a, like from a personal standpoint when i decided like when i was trying to decide what i wanted to do at varsity for example right i mm -hmm. basically went about putting down my options so i said well i said okay richard what do you enjoy doing i enjoy singing i enjoy playing french horn i enjoy playing computer games i enjoy uh, I enjoy programming, you know, and I was like, and I put them all down and I was like, okay, from this, like what, what career could you do? So there was like music or computer science or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then eventually I was like, okay, but well, what do you actually, what may, and then I, and the final question I said to myself was what makes you happy? And then that was music, right? So then I said, okay, well then music it is. So, and I, and I never really good back, like looked back because ultimately you only have one life so you may as well you may as well live a happy one as as far as as far as possible right so if you're going down a path that's i mean even if it's what you enjoy like if it's something that you want to do but you don't enjoy doing maybe that's not the thing that you should be doing you know maybe put that as a hobby like somewhere else in your life and then focus on something that can actually bring you like happiness because work is and what you do is like that's what you're going to be doing for the majority of your life right so, mm -hmm. Once, once you've finished studying, we work for the rest, most, like almost the rest of our life. So you've got to find something that you actually enjoy doing. Otherwise it's, it's pointless to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think even above and beyond that, you have to, I like the fact that you mentioned specifically happiness because you can enjoy something and be very good at it, but also realize it's not going to make you happy. It doesn't whatsoever. make you happy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which sucks, right? Like the, the realization that there are individual for, for each given individual there are actually optimal normative ways to behave that have nothing to do with your like pure decision making like there's things you're going to do that'll just make you happy versus things you do that won't make you happy and i think yeah. this also applies for, for relationships right like how many people have we come have we all come across in our lives where like in our dating lives where you'd be like you really enjoy spending time with this person this person is great you know um and they in some sense improve your life but you also know they don't truly make you happy. 
and that kind of yeah. like kills the relationship and there's nothing because there's nothing you can do like how do you you can't force yourself to be happy at some yeah. point right you, the best you can do is say i'm content i'm willing to accept what this thing is but you can never move yourself into a position of pure joy just by decision or can you i don't know i don't think i've, I've never heard of someone being able to do that it would be great if you could right that would simplify I, life it would be great it would, yeah but it also that's like mr robot you just turn on a switch and be like be happy you know what i mean <laughs> Oh, season three is out of that show, right? It is, I think, yeah. Uh, you know, there's we can something to talk about from that show. What do you think about? Because in that show, they make you know they go to a great pains to mention just how integrated everything has become, and the cost of both integration and convenience is both a loss of privacy and a loss of security. Um, do you think it's worthwhile to trade the two, like in order mm. to be more included in the world? at a, a faster to have a better inclusion in the world at a faster pace is it worth giving up your private space like is it worth retreating genuinely into only your head where the only place you can genuinely only be yourself is within you but as soon as you engage in the larger world you are now part of this societal monolith in a way and there's less of an idea of individual ruggedness as it were once you step outside of yourself do you think it's worth it in the long run mm. No, like yes if you can n n i would i dare say probably probably not like the, the the integrated world is creating more people that are alone than they than have than have ever been mm. because the more you become integrated the more you look at screens and cell phones the less you look at other humans and speak to them and that's where like a lot of our empathy i, th I feel is currently being lost it's much easier to look at a tragedy through a computer screen than it is to actually like go to the place and deal with people. You know what I mean? Mm. I mean, you find this even when, if you end up meeting people that you meet online, that no matter how vitriolic your conversations were in the online space, as soon as you find them in real life, it's much harder to summon that, that hate, that not, oh, hatred is the wrong word, but it's much harder to just be a jackass off the, off the boot, right? Oh, absolutely. Cause then you have to say it to someone's face and then, and he's looking at you, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Do you think this trend reverses once we get to a stage where technology allows us to actually have that face-to-face -face interaction? For instance, I can easily imagine a world where we all have implants that if you're on a phone call with someone, if you're texting someone, that I see your face in a digital sense um, to the degree where in my own monkey brain, my brain doesn't necessarily know, like I'll know consciously that you're not there, but in terms of the psychological impact of the communication, there might not be that much of a difference. Do you think yeah. once we get to that point that um, you suddenly find that now, as connected as we are, now we feel closer? Uh, no, because it's still only one, it's like, I, I've still only limited amounts of your senses, right? Mm. It, it, instead of having a person like actually physically in front of you that you can touch and feel. Um, so or if he, if he punches you, then you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll feel it. <laughs> If you get knocked out, you know someone's actually serious. You're like, okay, yeah. okay this is happening. All right. Yeah, he's not a, he's not a any. I mean, I do, I do. It does help, right? But I, again, like in an anonymous online space, which is what a large amount of the internet is, I don't feel like we'll ever reach that that place as in a large scale sense. Like, sure, we'll have that kind of communication, but I feel like it'll be between like family members and loved ones, much like mm -hmm. Skype is. Skype is now, you know, I don't think you'll ever reach like a Facebook level face, face on face shouting at each other. That would be an interesting movie concept though. That would be really cool. I'd watch that movie. That, that would be like a Black Mirror special. I'd watch that. Yeah. Do you, wait, do you actually, when you communicate online, right? Do you, is the, how much of a difference is there between how you communicate online and how you communicate in person? Uh, I try to keep them as, as the same as possible. Mm. The way that I speak in an online space, the way that I cast Dota, for example, is just the way that I, I speak and talk and do and do things. Right? There's not there's not much, there's not much different because I try I try to, that's who I am as a person and that's who I try to promote. If I if that, if that makes sense. So, it's, that's, yeah. That makes sense because like one of the things that I've noticed about the internet, right, is that if you find if you find somebody who professes that the online space is a legitimately different sphere of human experience, right? That the digital world has absolutely no is tracking nothing that's relevant to the real world in terms of how we communicate, right? 
you'll generally find that, or in my experience, I've seen that people who hold that view tend to be some of the worst actors when it comes to talking to people online. Um, can be very belligerent, cuss people out. Just yeah. don't take like they don't take you like as a proper human being, right? They'll say the most yeah. outlandish and dehumanizing thing. But then, like we were mentioning earlier, in person, oh, suddenly this person's acting like a lamb. And I think that's as a result of seeing it as a different space, right? As seeing it as, a, like, I think it's a, a, most people see it as a game. Like, you don't see the other people that you're interacting with as human beings. You see them as avatars in The Sim. So yeah. you're in The Sim. So you're like, whatever. I'm gonna, I can treat them as horribly as possible. Like, we, didn't you ever do that thing when you played The Sims where you put your Sims in a, in a, in a room with a stove? I'll tell you, you, I'll tell you what. You take the door. I tell you what uh, actually sort of changed my perspective on this was uh, my dealings as a Warcraft three admin on the Twilight server for <laughs> for many that? years, right? Get, having having users come to you um, and say like that user raped my sister, which was one which was some an accusation that we had, like and as War three admins, you're like, well, we are not qualified to deal with this. I'm a eighteen year old child at the time. Yeah. Um, but then to, to, to realize that like, these are humans and situations and there were so many things that went down on that server where it was like humans just shouting at each other. And then one day I realized I was just like, this is so stupid. You know, like people, there were two, there were two people in particular, two of the admins that were very, very aggressive, um, and not liked by the community. And then I actually met them in person. And like the one, for example, was half the size of I am when he was a little angry Polish man. And from that day in, I just felt like I wasn't scared of him at all. You know what I mean? Because I was like, well, I now know who you are. I've seen you face to face. Like you don't frighten me in the slightest, little man. <laughs> so, so it was, it, that was, it was a very interesting, that was an interesting experience because it sort of, it, it shattered that idea that once you'd actually met these people and realized that they were just humans and you realized that actually everyone is just humans and they're just there to play a game like and you shouting at them more often than not is ruining their day yeah usually right i can't remember the last time someone shouted at me and i was like oh thanks bro yeah this this, this helped me this day why do you think the gaming community is because like as bad as social media can be when it with regards to people not treating each other as actual human beings the gaming, there's nothing worse than online gaming, right? Like, it's by far the absolute worst thing. What is it about games that bring out the worst in us? I think it's our inner, the inner competitiveness of of games in general, right? Well, it depends on the community. Some communities have wonderful, have like, have a wonderful space of very supportive people, right? Whereas generally, it's the more the more competitive the game gets, I feel like the more toxic the community gets because that competitiveness i mean i always say to my friends i don't play dota for fun i play dota to win <laughs> yeah, that's right true. dota's not a dota's, dota's not, not a fun, fun game yeah, dota's, dota's not, not a fun, fun game yeah. you like dota if you want if i wanted to play a fun game i'd go play like rocket league or planet coaster or something you know like a game that's actually just genuinely fun fun to play like i don't play dota for fun i play dota to win and that's i think that's a lot of the mentality that's dota, well using the dota community as example that's the mentality that i think 99 percent of the people go into 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 a game with right i don't i don't i don't want to lose i want to win so when you start losing it's obviously going to be someone's fault and that's where things things fall apart um and the community gets super toxic because believe it or not in every game of dota there's a winner and a loser sean so <sighs> Really? That means no at clothes? least that, that means at least five people are going to be they have a chance of getting super salty in a game, which is fifty percent. Fifty percent of all Dota players are salty at any given time. <laughs> um, I, you know, I can guarantee that of that fifty percent, at least eighty percent of them had a jungle LC on their team. And Absolutely. Like, yeah. What is this? this is what like, is life? What is life? This is garbage. Also, like, the, the one thing you're right about is that when you're losing, that is, especially in a competitive environment, right? When you came with the express intention of winning, once you start losing, guaranteed some of the worst parts of you come out. Because, like yeah. I said, you, like, you want to blame someone. And the, the last person you want to blame is you, right? You don't want to be yeah. like, oh, I play trash. I'm the reason we lost, guys. The first person you want to look at the guy next to you and say, what the fuck, bro? Why did you mess this up? If it wasn't for you, we would have won the game. 
and then it becomes their fault and so soon it's everyone's fault except you yeah and all you can exactly it's an amazing mentality it's like an amazing mentality to have but one that is i mean i I've, I've done it i'm sure that you've done it i'm sure that every everyone's done it you know what i mean it's just fuck all these stupid noobs you know you're sitting on your team just screaming away just it's it's that, oh. it's that moment in the game when when you die right Do, doing something that objectively is your own fault and you were being dumb and then as soon as you die you know the response from your teammates going to be just the worst outrage so you just mute everybody yeah quietly and you're like well i don't want to deal with these people anymore then you're like but then at that point again it becomes this thing where when you're not and i think this is the the difference between Dota 1 and Dota 2 for me that's really interesting is the the fact that in Dota 2 more often than not you're actually communicating with your teammates like vocally right you'll hear their voices yeah. you know what they're like as people it's easier to remember that they are humans whereas in Dota 1 that was never really there unless you went out of your way to make it happen um, yeah. so it was hard for you to actually get that into your mind that oh okay these are actually other people that I have to respect take seriously they were just like whatever right and each game because you're not really communicating with your team it doesn't feel like a team game it just feels like you're doing your own thing and nine other people are also doing their own thing yeah <laughs> whereas now in Dota 2 people actually have to play as a team which which changes things right and I think games that like for example the people say that the LOL community is worse than the Dota one um, which I don't believe but you know which MOBA has a really actually really nice community the Heroes of the Storm community is quite nice for some yeah. for weird reasons and i think one of the reasons that it's it's very nice is because you don't have an option but to work as a team you can't do things alone if you try to solo the game you guaranteed will lose so yeah, yeah, yeah having to communicate with people having to interact having to work as a team makes you like again shockingly see them as other humans what a, what i a know surprise. right this human thing is confusing man a smite also has a pretty is it has like a pretty nice community actually for for boba i generally don't get shouted at or anything mm. Um, not that I played that often, but yeah. Like not getting yelled at in games is usually the best thing. So, but um, I, th- I think we've gone a bit past. Like we've been talking for an hour now. Some people might get tired of listening to this. I was yelled at for having two-hour episodes before, so I'm oh just gosh. keep that in mind for people. Um, but but Richard, really, thanks for your time. Thanks for. In- I learned things, and I'm gonna go watch that TED talk. Actually, I should put it in the show notes as well after this. I will go um, find it right now for you. Uh, do you want to tell people where to find you where to find your your for lol's blog where to find you in the sure tutorial? you can find me at uh richardshoberg.com that will get you to my uh central space and uh from there uh all my social media links to youtube to twitch to instagram to everything are all there otherwise in generally you can find me at slash demonic today twitter slash demonic today youtube slash demonic today facebook uh, it's Richard Demonic Showbook is my page if you look for it. So I'm all over the YouTubes. I will spam links at you, Sean, so you can find <laughs> put them in the thing, links as well. I definitely will do that. And ladies and gentlemen, that was Richard Demonic. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. If you enjoyed what you heard, you can like us on YouTube, share on your favorite social media, and most importantly, give us feedback. Tell us what you liked, tell us what you didn't like, and tell us what you'd like to hear in future. But above all, give yourself a pat on the back and continue to have interesting conversations.